Don't make a meal without that seal. DuPont, DuPont, DuPont. It ain't no deal without that no stick seal. Here's what you want. Without these seals, you're out of luck. Don't get stuck. It's the morning of an April day in 1938 when Roy J. Plunkett and his assistant Jack Reebok are experimenting with tetrafluoroethylene. Their current experiment is an attempt to make a new CFC for DuPont Incorporated. As just a few years earlier, the highly useful refrigerant Freon was invented. For this test, they cooled the TFE gas and then tried to release it with a valve, but saw no immediate results, thinking the valve had malfunctioned or clogged. They checked the inside of the cylinder, originally storing the gas, and to their surprise, they had created a slippery white powder. This powder would later be recognized as polytetrafluoroethylene, PTFE, a polymer which would become one of the most widely utilized polyfluoroalkyl substances ever. PTFE is only one of perhaps thousands of per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, called PFAS. These molecules, carbon and fluorine chains, form immensely strong polar covalent bonds, giving them temperature, scratch, and water-resistant properties. For these reasons, they certainly have a unique appeal for many products. Rain jackets, fluorocarbon fishing line, microwave popcorn bags, firefighting foam, and of course, your favorite non-stick Teflon cookware. PTFE is regarded as being safe for exposure in small amounts of ingestion, such as through pains, but several other closely related substances, such as PFOA, are widely known for increasing risk of organ diseases and several cancers. For the rest of the video, I may refer to PFOA as C8 or carbon chain 8 as it is commonly known. By the late 1940s, DuPont was producing several million pounds of PFAS a year. It had been tested on seals, valves, and fishing equipment, and had been highly effective as well. In 1954, Marc Gregoire, a French engineer, created the first PFAS coated pan after it was suggested to him by his wife. He named his brand Tefal, and soon DuPont would follow in his footsteps to make the multi billion dollar brand of Teflon coated pans. DuPont claimed that their new nonstick coating contained only PTFE, and even now, their quote, confidence in the security and performance of Teflon nonstick coatings is based on more than 50 years of laboratory testing and home and commercial use at normal cooking temperatures. But what is not mentioned in the same place on their website is that up until 2013, Teflon coatings contained PFOA, another type of PFAS which is now known for its damaging health effects, especially from repeated exposure. Further, DuPont as well as 3M hid for decades internal documents of studies which predicted organ damage and could have prevented worldwide exposure. And already by 1956, scientists knew that PFAS could bind to the human blood proteins. Bioaccumulation should have been the first red flag in exposure to these PFAS. This next report is from two doctors, Charles Lewis and Gerald Kirby. In 1962, 36 DuPont workers came down with a supposed polymer fume fever. Most of them had been smoking cigarettes, which were contaminated with fine PTFE particles on their hands from working around these chemicals every day in the factory. Since the particles were microscopic and dust-like, they easily spread from manufacturing equipment into the air. A few other men were experiencing the same symptoms due to an assembly process which involved heating a resin up to 750 degrees Fahrenheit with a hot air gun and then inhaling the same air. This air with pyrolyzed PTFE and PFOA particles proved to be quite damaging to the human body. The men experienced temporary chills and fever, but since the symptoms passed within a few days, DuPont decided to make menial changes to the facility, including adding a few air conditioners that bring in 25% outside air instead of only recirculating inside air all day long. This was reported to only help workers who were using the hot air guns, not those smoking, and only reduce symptoms instead of eliminating them. Lewis and Kirby end this report stating, quote, 
sufficient knowledge is available to classify this as a preventable disease. And perhaps in the 1960s, we still could have prevented the spread of such substances entirely. Around the same time, waste from the production of C8 was building up. DuPont officials decided the best course of action was to pack the waste into drums and then bury them in the shore of the Ohio River. Further, stones would be added to waste drums and these barrels would be cast into the ocean, where they would sink to the bottom. In the mid-1960s, this type of dumping ceased after a fisherman caught a barrel and raised public awareness. So DuPont resorted to burying the waste in unlined landfills, pouring it into their man-made ponds, releasing it straight into the air via smokestacks, and dumping waste into the Ohio River. One of the most heavily affected communities on Earth by this crisis is Parkersburg, West Virginia. DuPont opened up a plant in 1948 here to start producing its new miracle product, Teflon, and it would quickly become the town's largest employer, easily giving it a status of protection against local attorneys. DuPont scientists had been studying the effects of C8 exposure on rats since the 1960s, and the results were deadly. Enough exposure would cause the rat's organs to swell and eventually kill them. Balloon livers and kidneys were apparent in their dissections. DuPont had also seen in 1979 a 3M hosted study where several groups of small rhesus monkeys were exposed to different levels of C8 by ingestion. After a few weeks, the monkeys were seen to have their eyes swell, their faces turn pallid and white, have damage to their kidneys, and eventually, with enough exposure, die. Two years later, a study was shared by 3M again, this time on pregnant rats. When the rats were exposed to C8, there was a high chance of their unborn offspring having eye defects. As DuPont employed many women at Parkersburg, this was alarming. They informed the EPA as well as their employees and transferred all women who could be exposed to C8 at their plant to other jobs. Sadly, they did this too late. Sue Bailey was a Parkersburg employee who worked with Teflon during her first trimester in 1980. Her job was to pump an unknown liquid used or made in the production of Teflon into a pond and squeegee any bubbling overflows into a drain. Soon after her child, Bucky, was born, DuPont had started the job transferring process, but Bucky was not a normal child, as he had been born with a number of facial problems. He had a keyhole pupil, a misplaced eyelid, only one nostril, and as seen in the rat studies, tear duct deformities. DuPont scientists had been tracking eight women who were exposed to Teflon whilst being pregnant, of which Sue Bailey was one. Bill Fairweather had proposed that if one out of five women had children with craniofacial deformities, it should be considered that C8 was connected. As it happened, two out of the eight women in total had malformed children, but DuPont decided to not inform the EPA of this connection of C8 exposure to their births. Sue was then reassured by the plant doctor, Younger Lovelace Power, after she asked, I was in Teflon, is this what happened to my baby? that her line of work and exposure was not related to Bucky's birth. One year later, DuPont put all of the women back on the Teflon line. Ken Wamsley, a former employee, recalls being told by a supervisor that, well, we're afraid. We think maybe it harms the pregnancies in some women, and that, Ken, it won't hurt the men. In 1984, DuPont sent out an employee to go downriver to collect drinking water samples from stores in towns on the river and test them for C8 contamination. According to their standards for elevated levels, they detected high concentrations of C8 a quarter mile downstream and three miles downstream from the Parkersburg plant, now proving that not only Parkersburg, but other West Virginia communities were being affected. As C8 was still constantly being emitted into the air by smokestacks, continually buried in landfills, and being in contact with employees directly or indirectly, evidence would finally come out in 1989 of its worst ills. As many types of PFAS are nearly indestructible and microscopic, they had been building up in the bodies of everyone exposed. Every worker and every citizen in Parkersburg had been bioaccumulating C8 for decades, be it through the water and the air. In the Parkersburg plant, 
Their 1989 Mortality and Cancer Instance Surveillance Data Report showed elevated levels of kidney and urinary cancer, as well as leukemia rates, both being at, at about two times the expected amount among male employees. Wilbur Earl Tennant was a farmer who lived close to the DuPont Parkersburg plant. He had been operating a cattle farm of a few hundred cows when he noticed a huge problem in 1996. Many of his cows, as well as wild animals, had started dying unexpectedly on his property. His cattle had started losing weight, getting tumors, swollen organs, black colored teeth, and being aggressive to him among many other ailments. As they had been well fed with plenty of access to grain and grasses, he knew there was a major problem somewhere else on his property. There was a stream called Dry Run, which ran through his land, of which most of his herd preferred to drink from. He had watched the stream change since he first started farming there. Instead of being clear and having minnows come through occasionally, it had turned dirty, with a film on top often forming swaths of foam and encresting onto the shore, and quickly killing any minnows which came downstream. As it turns out, Wilbur's family had sold some land upstream of their farm right before he started noticing problems with the cows. It shouldn't surprise you to know that the buyer was none other than DuPont. They had told the family that a landfill was going to be constructed on the property, but it would be limited to non-hazardous waste only. Soon, DuPont went behind their backs on the agreement and dumped C8 waste from Teflon here. Normally, each modern landfill has a layer of sand, plastic, and clay to prevent leachate from spreading. Leachate being rainwater which has soaked through a landfill and absorbed some of its chemicals. Instead of lining the stump to prevent leaching into the stream, DuPont placed a pipe in the bottom of the landfill, allowing liquid waste to flow directly out and feed into dry run. This next clip is about 4 minutes long and contains graphics of animals, which may be disturbing to some viewers. Skip ahead to the time marked on the screen if you do not wish to view it. What I'm about to show you here in a little bit is part of this landfill. State of West Virginia issued E.I. DuPont Company a permit for them to run their contaminated wastewater down through two farms here, out into this stream of water here. They put an anti-sudson solution up here in this pond. This is a lower pipe. You can see what's coming out of it. You can see what it's like here on the bottom of the, the bed. That water shouldn't look like that. There's something little wrong with this water. And this stuff comes on down this stream of water. What effect will this anti-sudsin solution have on the livestock? I've taken two dead deer and two dead cattle off of this ripple right here. And they tell me the deer died with hemorrhoging disease. Well, it was hemorrhoging disease all right. The blood run out of their nose and out of their mouth. But uh, they've never, DNR has never checked into it. They need the EPA of the state of West Virginia to try to cover this stuff up. But it's not going to be covered up because I'm going to bring it out in the open for people to see. Something wrong with this cow. Stoppers are running clear to the ground. And they keep trying to tell me there's nothing wrong with these things. I can call the West Virginia State Veterinary and Doc Thomas, and the only thing he asked me is, I had, do you have a good attorney? I'm not, uh, I'm not worried about attorney. I'm worried about the health of these cows. Something other that he don't have sense enough to respect the other people's stuff. As you can see, she's hemorrhaged out the nose. You call this hemorrhoging disease or whatever you want to call it, but this cow died with extremely high fever. You can see the discoloration in the hair here on her neck. This is 153 of these animals that I've lost on this farm. 
And the state veterinary, Doc Thomas, he won't come up here to do anything about it. And every veterinarian that I've called in Parkersburg, they will not return my phone calls or they don't want to get involved. So since they don't want to get involved, I'll have to dissect this thing myself and I'm going to save the parts of it and I'm going to start at this head of it. One of the things I've noticed right off is the discoloration of these jaw teeth. This is on the top. And here's his tongue. I don't know what those little red spots are in there on the bottom part of that thing's tongue. I don't know. This is very unusual here. Looks like milk coming up on that meat tissues. Now, I never saw nothing like this in my life. Here's its gall. That cow suffered, buddy, when she died. Well, this is what they expect a man's cows to drink on, their, on his own property. And it's about high time somebody in the state of the department of something or other got off their cans. As Wilbur mentioned, he had to take matters into his own hands. After contacting the DNR, EPA, and several veterinarians with no helpful responses, he decided to try and find a lawyer. Robert Ballot at the time was a corporate defense lawyer who defended chemical companies in lawsuits. Through a connection of families and family friends, he was convinced to take Wilbur's case. Upon arriving at the property, he quickly realized that an investigation needed to be done. They contacted DuPont and the EPA, who each sent three vets to conduct a report on his land. At the end, Wilbur was blamed for providing, quote, poor nutrition, inadequate veterinary care, and a lack of fly control, unquote, all of which were clearly lies, as he had been feeding his cows double of what they should have eaten, yet they still withered away. However, this did not discourage Blot, so they filed a class action suit on behalf of tens of thousands of West Virginians against DuPont for dumping PFOA in the landfill next to Dry Iron Creek, as well as contaminating the drinking water for several communities along the Ohio River. Billot was provided all the information he needed through internal documents of DuPont to prove that they had knowingly disposed of C8 waste in the irresponsible waste for decades. And so in 2004, after fighting Billot every step of the way, DuPont settled for over $300 million to construct filtration plants and private wells as well as set up an independent scientific panel to test the blood of residents and look for a link between C8 and any diseases. After several years, the science panel found a direct correlation between exposure to PFOA and several cancers and diseases. This includes kidney cancer, testicular cancer, ulcerative colitis, thyroid disease, high cholesterol, pregnancy-induced hypertension, and potentially more. Blot continues to fight them to this day and has extensively helped West Virginian and Ohioan communities exposed to contaminated drinking water receive over $750 million in total. The capital of my home state, Madison, Wisconsin, is well known for its lake chain, including Mendota, Monona, Wingra, Wabisa, and Kaganza. Unfortunately, each one of these lakes and their connecting rivers are contaminated with PFAS. The usage of firefighting foam combined with manufacturing and littering is believed to have caused the contamination of each lake and the animals and people which live nearby. And now it is advised that eating fish from the Madison lakes is very limited as there is contamination of mercury, PCBs, and especially PFAS in every single fish which the DNR has tested. Though DuPont has stopped the production of PFOA, it has replaced it with another PFAS called Gen X. With it, it brings eerily similar adverse health effects. PFAS are still used in countless products which we all touch every day and contaminate the waters, lakes, and rivers across the world. It's in the blood of 99% of all animals on the entire planet, including humans. 
So as you click off, think about how you are exposed to PFAS and what you personally can do to limit your exposure as much as possible. Thank you for watching and have a nice day. There was a lot more information which I didn't have time to include in this documentary, so if you would like to learn more on this topic, I highly recommend watching Dark Waters and The Devil We Know, and researching what happened at Fayetteville in the Cape Fear River.